Hello, everyone. This is Cracking System Design Interviews and Episode 3. Today, we are going to talk about message queue. Message queue is a very important component in distributed systems. So we are going to uh, learn it today. And uh, we are going to learn um, what is a message queue, like when to use message queue, and how to use message queue. So message queue, there are only two words. One is message. What is a message? Like in web crawler, a message can be a URL. A message can be an integer. A message can be any string. Basically, a message can be anything. And which is queue? Queue is a very um, basic data structure, like first in, first out. OK, so uh, for this PPT, I referenced some websites, basically uh, the three websites here. They are very useful. So if you have time, you can also take some, like, uh, like take some time to read about it. OK, so basically, a message queue is a queue of messages sent between applications. Uh, it includes a sequence of work objects that are waiting to be processed. A message is the data and transported between the sender and the receiver application. It's essentially a byte array with some headers at the top. Uh, message queue uh, can be used for IPC. IPC is inter-process communication. We know um, there's a producer, there's a consumer. Basically, there are two process, per processes. They can be in the same instance. They can be in different instance. But there are two different processes. And they're communicated via the message queue. So a producer can create some or produce some messages and send this message to this shared message queue. And the consumer can pull some messages from this message queue and to process the message. OK, let's take a simple example. We have a unique ID generation service. And each time this unique gener ID generation service can generate one unique ID. And we have a service A. Every time uh, service A will call the unique ID generation service to get a unique ID. For example, this service may be something like the user registration service. Every time the service A receives a client request, it tries to get a unique ID from this unique ID generation service. OK, so far so good. Um, but uh, as time passed by, the unique ID generation service is very popular, and the company is becoming bigger and bigger. And there's Team B and Team C. Team B and Team C also want to use this unique ID generation service to get some unique ID for their services. So things become very complicated. Whenever a new team trying to use this service, like they will talk to us, and uh, we need to set up some meeting. We need to fig figure out like what's the QPS, how many new in instances I need. Like, like um, we also need to set up some maybe metrics to monitor the P2P, for example, P P2P SAO, like the latency, the availability. So we can say the unique ID generation service is deeply coupled with service ABC. And we also need to monitor, for example, the latency for all peers. And if unique ID generation service is unavailable, then ABC are also unavailable. So in this case, um, we can introduce the middleware, the message queue. So um, the unique ID generation service can just generate, generate a bunch of unique IDs and then send them to the message queue. And ABC, uh, if they want to get some unique ID, they can just fetch unique IDs from message queue. Let's take another example. Maybe we have a user registration service. User registration service will receive the client request. When it receives the client request, it will save, the, uh, for example, the username, password, user email address to the user database. Then it will just um, tell user that uh, your re registration is successful. At, at the same time, User registration service will push some tasks in the message queue. It will push three tasks. One is uh, like uh, please text this message, or please text uh, this user. One is um, please email this user. One is please tell uh, the friends of the user. Like in the text notification service, 
it it will just send a text to this user that uh, welcome like your registration is su uh, successful like we have some promotions for you blah, blah blah and in this email notification service we just send an email to this user's address like tell him or her that we have some promotions blah blah, blah. and uh, maybe this, in this platform there are some friends of this user so we will just notify the user's friends that uh, this user is uh, in this platform. So for these three tasks, we don't need to process them in the same request, right? Since uh, it may take some time, if, if we, mer uh, like if we uh, register users and text email and do the friends notification, then finally, um, like return the response to user is time consuming since there are a lot of tasks, but there are some tasks that uh, we don't very care about it. Since we can process them later, we just need to uh, process user requests and uh, re return to the user as soon as possible that the registration is successful. That's good. We can do the no notification stuff later. So we can just push some tasks to this message queue. And for the advantage of using message queue, uh, we can say decoupling. Since previously, like a uh, unique ID generation service is done, then ABC is done. But uh, if unique ID ser generation service is done, but we have some unique IDs in message queue, ABC can also work. And the uh, performance. So producer does not need to wait for the task to be finished. So in, in this case, we can just uh, save the user data to the user database and just return the response. For these other three tasks, we can process them later. And it's easy to scale. So uh, it, it's easy to add user registration instance. It's easy to add, for example, the email notification service instance. And the peak clipping, sometimes we have a very high QPS, but for the peak, peak QPS, like uh, we can make the synchronous call to an indirect asynchronous notification. For example, uh, like, like this, sometimes for the peak QPS, it's very hard to process them in the same time. So we can just push some tasks in the message queue. Then later, for example, in one minute later, uh, the peak QPS may be become uh, like mitigated. So we can just process them later. Okay. For the disadvantages, it's very clear. Uh, first, we introduce a middleware, the message queue when to maintain it. For example, there are some potential uh, issues, which if we consume the same message twice, which if we lose some messages. So these are all the issues that we should uh, take into account. And inconsistency. A producer uh, is not sure if consumer can successfully consume the message. Three. Availability, which is if message queue is down. These are all the issues that we need to think about. And as for reliability and availability, and like uh, we know that um, if we store the message uh, in the memory only, then if the instance is down or the electricity is down, then we just lose all the messages. It's not acceptable. So for most message queues, we can process the message queue uh, messages in disks, and uh, for the replication, um, normally there may be uh, multiple instances and several instances they have the same message, so it improves uh, the availability. And there are a lot of open source message queue implementations, and there are more than three, but I only list three here: Kafka, RabbitMQ, and RocketMQ. And uh, in most cases, uh, people are like Kafka and RabbitMQ are discussed most. So I will briefly um, talk about Kafka and RabbitMQ, but just a very brief introduction. So for RabbitMQ, the so component here is uh, the RabbitMQ. Producer does not send the message QQs directly. Instead, the exchange receives this message then the exchange will wrote the message to the corresponding queue. We can see there are two queues. For example, the first queue may be uh, 
text notification queue. The second queue may be email notification queue. And the exchange knows uh, like when the producer produces uh, the message, we will set up some metadata. Then the exchange knows like which queues to uh, load this message queue. And there's a binding. Binding must be set up between the queue and the ex exchange. Like in this example, we have bindings to two different queues from the exchange. And the exchange can load the message into the correct queue. Then the consumer just um, consumes the message in the correct queue, in the right queue. Okay, then for the Kafka, Kafka is also a distributed message queue. And we can see there are also some um, producers that produce message and send the message to Kafka cluster. And there are also a lot of consumers to just pull the message from the Kafka cluster and process the message. And this graph is from this website. We can see a typical Kafka uh, architecture includes several producers here. And this producer can be like produce server logs or produce some business data and page views. For example, the producer may produce message like, uh, like, like this user maybe view a website or in Amazon, this user click uh, this product. All this message can be like created and for analysis. And for the consumers, they can just process this message and uh, maybe generate some reports. Okay, and there are also some several um, brokers. Brokers is just uh, like an um, instance. One broker can be regarded as one in instance, one machine. And in this machine, we uh, store some messages. And there's also a zookeeper cluster. Zookeeper is a service that used in distributed system to co coordinate the distributed systems. And uh, Kafka manages the cluster configuration through Zookeeper. For example, we can register the service and elect the leader and rebalance, uh, rebalance uh, once the consumer group changes. And the producers use uh, this push mode to post message to brokers to the message queue. And consumers use pull mode like, to subscribe and consume messages from brokers. Okay. And let's compare RabbitM and Kafka briefly. RabbitMQ has a message acknowledgement. So it's um, popular in the high reliability use cases, for example, in finance. Kafka is famous for the high throughput. So it's very good for big data process. And for cluster load balance, we can see that Kafka uses to keep a cluster like to rebalances when the consumer group changes. But for RabbitMQ, it needs external uh, load balancing. You can say uh, in the episode two, I talk about the web crawler and we use RabbitMQ here. So in this case, um, we use RabbitMQ and it has message acknowledgement. And for each instance, it's a producer, it's also a consumer. For one instance, um, like we use one message from this RabbitMQ and we use this URL to fetch page. It's also a consumer since we get the con contents from this page and we extract some other new URLs and we add these new URLs to our RabbitMQ. And this is our uh, initial example. For this message queue, we can store some um, tasks here. When the user registration service receives the user request, it just stores the uh, username, password, email address, something like this into user database. Then it just push some message, push some tasks to this message queue. Then just uh, return response to user says, uh, your registration is successful. Then there are some tasks. For example, this may be a Kafka cluster. And there may be three different queues. One is for text notification. One is for email notification. One is for friends notification. And later, the three service can consume the corresponding message from the queue, process this queue, and send some notifications. OK, so it's a brief introduction to message queues and 
uh, which is message queue. When do we use message queue and uh, how to use message queue? And uh, I just give a brief introduction to WebM2 and Kafka. But uh, these two open source message queues are very popular. So if um, I have time, I will uh, make some more PTs to like, deep, deep play and discuss and learn WebMQ Kafka with you. Okay, thanks. That's it. See you next time.